This is Swarfcast. I'm Noah Graff. I am very honored to be with Damon Pistolka, co-founder of Exit Your Way and host of the Faces of Business podcast. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me today, Noah. This is such a pleasure. I was on Damon's podcast a couple weeks ago. Uh, He has a live podcast, which I am in awe of because that's like taking this whole thing to another level. I tried this the last week and um, let's just say I need to work on it. Um, So first, let's jump into getting a brief overview of Exit Your Way. Um, Just so people have a little context. What, What does your company do? Well, what we really do, Noah, is we help business owners that want to grow their value and prepare for sale and eventually sell their business. You know, what we, we've got a business brokerage. We had it for, my partner had it for a number of years and I started working with him and, and I soon realized that a lot of the people that wanted to sell a business were not able to sell a business just because it, you know, we can have a lot of smart technical people, but they you know, if you're doing everything, if you're the brains in it and, Ugh. and it's, it's like, that's, you're the value when the business, you try to sell the business, you know? Um, and it, so it really limits you. It limits you a lot. And, yeah. They own a job uh, rather than yeah, they own a job. The basically they own a job and you can transfer that job to somebody else and sell your business. Say you got a, you know, like in you guys case, you got a machine shop, you can sell it to the machine shop down the street, but you know, if you build that thing up to the point that the machine shop down the street or somebody else um, in the industry can't buy and it's big enough that a, an investor has to get into it, it has to be more than just a job. And that's where we really started because we worked with investor-owned companies prior to what we do and we would buy, build, and sell. And that's what we're helping people do now. Awesome. Okay. I'm going I'm, to I'm gonna dig deeper into that in just a second. Um, but first I want to get a little, a little, um, give me your five minute bio. And if you want, you can take even longer than that. I, I know you have some, uh, manufacturing background, which is awesome for, for our show. Um, you know, I've interviewed a couple people who, who talk about doing some similar things about helping people's business um, get its act together, et cetera. But, uh, it's nice to interview somebody, you know, who, who speaks our language. So Mm -hmm. yeah. Tell me how you got to where you are. Um, well, it was, it's kind of an accident in the beginning. I mean, serendipity. Yes, it was, it was serendipity. I mean, it was, it was, I, all the way back to college, right? I, I, uh, I got to college. Uh, I was, I got there and I, I, I was, people thought I was going to go on agriculture because I grew up on a large farm in South Dakota. And, and I had a friend of mine that I met in the dorm that was, he was in engineering and I was like, what's this engineering stuff? So after the first semester, I started taking more engineering classes and I was like, Oh man, I like this physics and some of the math and this kind of stuff. And that I always been the kind of that. I, so finally I, I was like, I'm going to be, I'm going to do a mechanical engineering degree. And I still didn't really understand what the hell I was going to do. when I was done other than they said, well, you get to design stuff and build things. And that, that's, that's all me. I mean, growing up on the farm, we, we would be building and fixing and doing all kinds of stuff like that. So I like to work with my hands and do that stuff. And uh, eventually I, I got an internship with a manufacturing company like my sophomore year or something like that. I just, somebody said, Hey, there's internship and I got it. And what kind of engineer were you, or that was just sort of general engineering at the time. Yeah, I was in general engineering at that point, but, but I was, uh, uh, I got a, I was actually an, like an assistant in an R and D prototyping Hmm. place. Well, what I didn't realize they didn't realize is they unleashed me inside of a little machine shop to, and that had things like we could cut metal, we could 
we could we had little Bridgeport mills. We mm-hmm. could mill stuff, and so I was making prototype parts, and I was making, and we were we were doing electronic. It was an electronic test equipment manufacturer. So I would make housings. I'd make the feed. I'd make the knobs. I'd make all this kind of stuff that went on it. And it spoke like, to you. Oh hey, yeah, it was just like this is like holy heck! I've never played with this equipment like this before, and it is so much fun. Well, you know, they I, I can remember on that first thing I said. Dude, you you can't you can't work more than this many hours in a week. I said, well, I really like it. <laughs> so it just started off like that, you know. So I I I one of their um, customers or one of their suppliers when this was not in my college town is I don't know a little ways away. This is in and, South Dakota. Uh, it was in South Dakota, yeah. It was in South Dakota, and it was in Sioux Falls is where I was at. And this it was the biggest town in South Dakota. You're in Chicago. You kind of know Sioux Falls. But yeah. the college was in Brookings. It's like 50 or whatever miles north of there. So I so we go back to school in the fall. And when I was there, they said, hey, there's this molding company in Brookings that we buy a lot of stuff from. You should talk to them. So I so I did, and they didn't have anything at the minute. But they said, "Hey, I think in the spring or something, we're gonna we're gonna look at it." Well, I got a call like a month after. They said, "Well, we decided to do it now. Come on in." Well, I got a job there in a molding company again in the tool room, which it was even cooler because they had some stuff that was you know you could I forget it was kind of not the tape kind of stuff, but you had the old Fanuc controls on it, or you could nice. program stuff in right. So what year G-code is this? Cur- this is like 85, okay. 80, is that right? Yeah. 80, 80, no, 86, 87, something like that. So, uh, they were growing really fast. This molding company was growing really fast. And what I didn't realize is like, I was going to get to do whatever I could honestly. And so they, they started out, I was drafting molds. I was like hand drafting molds. They taught me how to do it. And I was like, okay, I can start drawing this. And, you know, and, and this whole visualization of these things and, and putting it on the big old thing was a lot of fun, but long story short, I was able to, you know, put their first, uh, CNC controlled machines in their first cam software, just tons of stuff like that at the beginning. That was so much fun. And they were growing so fast that we hired a bunch of engineers. I worked right through college, got out of there. And and eventually, I don't know, six, seven years later, I had already built a couple of facilities for them because they were growing so fast in the, in the local area. And they said, Hey, we're going to build a plant in Tennessee. Do you want to go down there and build it and run it? And I'm like, wow. Yeah. Were you a mechanical and engineer? Yes. Yes, huh. I was. I was a mechanical engineer at that time. And so I was able to go down there and we built a ground up. It was, it was literally a cornfield in between Memphis and Nashville in this little town called Lexington. And we, they're still there. They're a lot bigger now than they were when I was there, obviously, but I built it, ran it for five years. I traveled all over the Southeast going to, you know, everything from a pure Denzel plant to you go, I was in a lot of these seat manufacturers, fire extinguishers, just anything you could think of. Anybody that was buying plastic, the hand tools, all these hand tool, Porter Cable, Campbell Housefield, all these different places, just all over the South. And that was such a learning experience. And you were learning to... from what each place was doing, their process. Yeah, each place was doing. And we were, we were and, and we, over that time, that we started out with a very small amount of seed business when we built that because out of South Dakota, they had some customers down there, had some salespeople down there. And, and what we were able to do is we turned that into, at that time, you know, quintupled it. So it was only like seven, eight million dollars worth of business when I left five years later. But we had done a lot of fun stuff. We were able to, we were the first first facility in the company that ran 24 seven, which was super cool to be able to do that. We were, we were the, the facility that ran the lowest defect rate out of anyone um, because we had to learn how to do that supplying the automotive and the television plants and everything else that we were doing electronics companies and the tooling because their their you know income and quality requirements were 200 parts per million which is ridiculously low uh defect rate but it really drove us to be super super good at what we did in the molding facilities well i that was a family owned company i was able to uh Go as that I was as high as I could get in that company, right. and I moved moved to another company. And without knowing it, 
I moved into a company that was investor owned. And what we were doing there, we were making checkout counters for grocery stores across the United States, had two facilities, one in Tennessee, right, right where I was, huh. and another one here in Seattle. And didn't know anything about it. So I started running a facility for them. It was a couple hundred thousand square feet. At that time, I think there were 150 or 200 employees in it and and had a lot of fun with that. And a year and a half later, uh, the owner came to me and said, hey, I want you to, I want you to run the company. So wow. that's how I got to Seattle. And now I had two plants that I was running and, and different things like that and um, had a ball with it because I, I figured out not me, the team. I was able to put together a really good team. And together, we figured out how to do something that just that was so fun in the industry because that industry was a six to eight week lead time kind of thing. The checkout counter. And the, the checkout counter. So we'd have Safeway or we'd have Albertsons or, you know, whatever's in your area, Meyer or somebody like yeah, that yeah. that's probably in your area. You know, they'd order from us and and we were Kroger. Kroger we did Kroger nationally as well. So we were doing QFC and all the other ones they've got. And uh, they would order. It'd be six, six to eight weeks later, we'd have their product done. But what I had is I had 400,000 square feet of manufacturing between the two facilities and I had about 100,000 square feet between the two facilities that all it did is held orders that were setting there that we had finished for a certain date, but the construction schedule changed. So I'm sitting here one summer because summer was always the busiest time. These th these holding areas would just get jam packed full of, of product, right? And and then inevitably you have have someone ram a forklift through the side of one of them, <laughs> you know, or something stupid like that. And and I'm like, why do we have $2 million of finished products setting here. And someone just said, well, that's just the way it is. You know, we got a six week lead. And this was a long term. It's never good when somebody says that's just the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's just the way sign. it is because they're changing, changing construction schedules around on that. I said, well, he said, because, you know, they place an order eight weeks early and then, you know, the construction schedules change and we never know. I said, well, how, how, close to the delivery date, does a construction schedule not change? And they said, well, you know, four weeks, nobody changes after four weeks because, you know, in a new store, food will be coming in and they got, every, you know, everything's coming after four weeks. I said, okay, let's figure out how to make these things in two. And everybody thought I was absolutely effing crazy. And, and I, I said, if we can make them in two weeks, I've just taken $2 million out of our inventory that's setting here. I said, that was my first goal. And I was like, I didn't even think about the other implication, implications in it. So we got the team down and started talking about it. And ultimately we found design things where we had, it was a 60 year old company too. So you designed something one way, I designed it a little bit different. They both looked the same on the outside why the heck don't we make them the same on the inside? Mm -hmm. And we did those kind of simple things. And we literally within about three years took, took our, our, where our manufacturing space from uh, 200,000 square feet in each place down to 100,000 square feet in each place. Wow. And, and we got it so we could do them in 10 business days. And, it, and what it did for us, a, you know, space, efficiency we dropped the cost by about 25 percent too by doing it our cost and uh, so we were more profitable and what we could do though is we could we could kill our competitors because we could deliver in four weeks not even pushing us to the two weeks we would say four weeks for new customers and what were the competitors doing six weeks six to eight weeks because yeah. that's what it had been forever and they were set up to do that and and we just started taking customers at will and yeah. we because we are lower cost lower cost and we could go faster and i was like wow this is this is really cool it took us a year and a half and we got bought it was that fast it was yeah. just like we started to make waves you know because we were able to do some really fun deals like this is the time when dollar tree stores were expanding like crazy and they would they would pump out they pump out hundreds of stores in a year new stores and we said hey we'll Anywhere in the U.S., 48 hours. We'll have, we'll have product at your store in 48 hours. We just con them. We had 
like okay so what happened then after you got bought out that after we got bought out i i did turnaround work for investors the investors kept kept having me work in different companies i was running and and that's when i really got like the the was it a private equity firm yeah it was owned by a partially two independents and a private equity firm and that private equity firm had me start working in some of their other companies so they just were like i could see that you're the one that was responsible for yeah getting getting you know everything yeah and And that was like launched my career yeah they had me come and do that and i did that for the next i don't know how many years with them and other people and and i in the in after that though the checkout counter place was cool and we machined in there with with cnc controlled routers you know like 10 by 12 bed or whatever the heck they were but the fun stuff when you talk about machining is after that because some of these were were aerospace companies up here in seattle where we had the the big five well big for aerospace uh in the companies I was in, it's not big in the world. Cause I saw some of these hundred foot long, you know, multi-head five axis things making these great big aerospace parts. But we had some 10 foot by, uh, you know, it was eight by 12 by four foot envelope kind of things. We had a few of those and they were, they were, I forget what the name, they were like SNK machines and they had this real mm. articulating head. <laughs> it was just so you amazing love, what they could do. You love the iron. You love the technical stuff. Oh God. Yeah. But you, can, I, but I, you also like just the business aspects of yeah. it all. What, which thing speaks to you more? The business speaks to me more, but the connection between the iron and the business is where I really geek out and have a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Because when you can see the connection between a machine running and the bottom line in your business, things get a lot clearer. And when you can look at a financial statement and go, there's something in here that means we should go there and talk to people and learn more about it and see what we should do. That's where really my brain that the engineering logic that I was drilled into my head and, and stuff over the years has really become fun because I can diagnose business things by looking at financials and walking around and seeing what's going on. Mm -hmm. But your company, you work with lots of different ones, software. Yes. um, And well, yeah, go on. We focus in on on manufacturing, e-commerce, construction, and and uh, some occupational rehabilitation. So we we really it's not as wide as some with the work with anybody, and and mm-hmm. so we're working with people, equipment, and you know inventory products, that kind of stuff. So I won't so tell they, the other people that you're working with, but is manufacturing like the one you most want to sink your teeth into, or you you have a great appreciation for all of them? You know, I really with the ones that I like the most is one I'm 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 actually talking to here shortly uh, in in the next few weeks is is I really like manufacturers that sell through e-commerce. Interesting, because you 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 talk about something where data and manufacturing come together and that you can geek out to no ends in about a four hundred different ways. So it's like B to C. Yeah, well, B to B. B to B, B to C doesn't really matter. I mean, oh, okay, could be um, like MSC or something. Yeah, well, I mean, you talk about think about something like a, um, well, a bulldozer. Okay, bulldozer is a great example. I'm selling to another company. Um, I, I might be selling my my maintenance parts to a distributor. I might sell it direct to the customer. I'm manufacturing them someplace too. And how do I connect all that together? And then how do I make sure that it's all working right and we're making money? I yeah. Mean, that kind of stuff just, I just geek out on it. I think it's fun. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, all right. I want to get into stuff that manufacturing companies should think about, et cetera. But the first thing that comes to my mind is, so, okay, so you guys are, you're doing M&A, but your thing is you're going in and helping people make their businesses saleable. And it, the two, it sounds like a wonderful combination, but the thing that 
keeps hitting me is when you're really trying to build up a business, um, like, you know, I guess there's the whole Simon Sinek why, right? Like if people are just trying to, I guess they're not just trying to, but you know, they're, they're, they have you in there to help them build it so they can sell it. And if you're building something to sell it, um, I mean, I get it because people, some people just, they love business. They love just building something that makes money and, um, and, and, and that's, that's great too. But, you know, if somebody's got a vision, a purpose, uh, for this thing, and then they get in to, all right, now I just want to get the most money for exiting. Um, I want to know, I'm sure you guys talk about this all the time and I want to know what you observe about it and, you know, how authentic the people are, et cetera. Yeah. It's not as cutthroat as, as it, it sounds for, for the people we work with because mm-hmm. they're not straight investors, right? They're, they're people that typically want to make a difference in their community and the lives of the people that they will. But the underlying thing is they're trying to generate wealth for their family. And okay. that wealth is going to, they need so much of that to do it, whatever the number is, you know. And that's really what we're concentrating on for them is generating wealth for their family. And that that's usually the underlying factor that we're really looking at. And, and, and not to the, to the, I mean, this is why we don't work with investors. We're not with investor owners, but these are, these are people that are, you know, they're in a community. They can make different, they can make different decisions for the long term rather than a short term gain, a short term yeah. gain. And, and it's, it's not, it, you, it's not like we build and we sell it right away. It's like we build, we put the team together. We this thing is going to be set up so that it's going to stay in the community and it's going to work work for the people there for a long time. And right. that's that's the thing that's that we really really I see. enjoy. So it's kind of like they do care about this thing that they're creating. Oh yeah. Um, and you're coming yeah. in, and it's not just how we can be more efficient so your family can get more money it's it's sometimes to the extent of we want a legacy of these parts continuing to be made right it's not just getting more money for our company yeah. no and that's and then, the thing that's and cool then they about can it. choose who they buy who's who they sell it to whether it's a a hundred percent you know hundred percent because well, we, we work with a lot of yeah. family offices and that for selling the businesses. I mean, when you talk about somebody that wants legacy, you really look at who's going to buy it because there's a lot of family offices that want to invest and hold things for the long term. If you were, if it's big enough to be an investment purchase. And we look at those because we understand what, no, what, what are you as a business owner looking like for your legacy? What do you really not? Is there some people, some people, it's a huge thing. Some people, it's not such a big thing, but we want to make sure that we look at that because it has to be sold to the right place because you've invested your time sweat and and effort and you've got these people that have invested right alongside you their time and their history and their life um you know you can make it a really good long-term thing for the people there if you do to get to the right buyer yeah yeah i i get it I, i but you know what i've seen in our very limited um very limited experience of selling machining companies, very small ones. People come in and the first thing they're interested in is I want my employees to keep their jobs. Um, I want, you know, they're sort of interested in, in this legacy and, and then they eventually they're just fed up and they're just like, screw it. Like I, you know, I got some money for it. I'm free now. And, um, you know, (laughs) business is business. Like I, I'm, you know, the, the, it becomes more like not even, is this person going to keep the business going and becomes more, is this buyer somebody I can work with? Uh, you know, like they'll take less money 
if it's just somebody that they feel like respects them and and they can they can work with. Uh, so I, I just, I don't know, maybe we're going on a tangent here, but I just, I, I guess you've given me a really good answer. I, I guess my feeling was, you know, oh, you have one foot out the door and now they're coming in and you're basically just basically going, oh, no. you know, if you give one less olive in the jar, you're going to make a lot more money, you know, and then we're, you're going to like, but it, it, it seems like what you're doing is going in and enhancing people's vision. I mean, that's, that's the idea. It's not just, yeah. let's cut costs and, yeah, and make no, sure, no, it's not, make sure the bottom line is better. I mean, I'm sure yeah. there's some of that. And then you're also well, coming in and, and then trying to help the, 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 the owner replace themselves. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the vast majority of the work we do is team, team building and getting the right people in the right seats because that's, it's, it's the Achilles heel of almost every small business is that they don't have the right people in the right seats or the people that they have in the seats are not the right people that should be in those seats. And, yeah. and they haven't taken the time to de define roles and responsibilities as they go. Cause you know, my business at one size is much bit different than my business at the other size. And when I hit that, that higher level, I plateau. And you start to find things where, okay, we start missing stuff. Things start, you know, quality problems, delivery problems, all these cost problems start to happen. Well, you, all that is, is you, you've moved beyond some of your systems and some of your people. So you either have to help those people grow, get your systems better to do those things. And, and that's where, uh, that's what the vast majority of our work is to really help that because it's not that we want people to work harder in these, these situations, unless they're just absolutely slacking, which that's, such a minute amount of people that it's not even worth talking about. It's really about getting people the training and the tools and empowering them to do what you really would like them to do as that owner. And when that kind of gets that, that cohesive environment where people are really humming and doing what they need to do, I mean, that feeds on itself. You can grow businesses like that. And, sure. and then you're not worrying about cutting costs because cutting costs only does so much. Growth is where, where it is. Profitable growth is where, adding business value comes from because I can, okay, so I cut 25% of your workforce. That gets me whatever that does. Well, what happens if I grew the top line by 25%? Yeah. How much better would that be? Or double my top line or quadruple my top line because now we're doing things better and people start to go, oh man, they got something going on. That's, that's where you make your, your best return on your money. And, and as an owner, these owners aren't saying one foot out the door. They're like, this is like they built their perfect, they built their perfect classic car. The one that they wanted so bad when they were in high school that they were just in a shiny. How often does it happen where they build the classic car and then they're just like, oh, never mind, I don't want to sell the classic car. It happens. It happens. They do it. They do it. Yeah. And you, it and you, and, and your business profits yeah. either way because that's yeah it does you it does we have we have it set up so i mean we we know you can fall in love with your business that's awesome how often awesome. does I mean, that we, happen one out of four interesting yeah i mean it happens you love it right and we say cool you, you that's great you're you you just went from x to y which is usually millions and millions of dollars right and it's it's something that yeah you can fall in love with it you can stay in another five years if you want don't recommend it but if that's what you want to do more power to you if you want to sell it later sell it later we'll help you whatever it's just you gotta i mean when you truly can work with somebody and and be happy about whatever outcome they choose it's a lot better i mean because when you look at the brokerage industry overall that only gets paid when they sell a business it sucks for them, it sucks for the business owner. Um, and some reasons, some situations, that's the way it should be. But Why when you we say work it sucks for clients, the broker and sucks for the business owner? Well, because in that situation, right? So if we're in a long-term relationship and and because we work with our clients, I mean, short is a year. Most of them are three to five years, maybe even longer or some. And... So if you work in that long-term relationship and I'm like, hey, 
um, if we don't sell it, I don't get paid, me as Damon. I look at that a hell of a lot differently than if we, if you don't sell it, I mean, you decide it's just going to be a long-term hold. We get paid no matter what. I'm going to just keep right on going. But if I'm a broker and I'm in there and I only get paid when that thing gets sold, what's, I want to get sold. Why are we not? Why are we waiting? We're at odds. The other thing is, really, you know, the, the first situation is we can help them build. We can really be a partner about what they want for their long term, what they want for their life, their legacy, their family. And, and, and no, really I mean, that's amazing. That they want I, that's amazing. I, I guess my, you know, coming from where I'm coming from on a very, you know, we're. It's a different model. We're smaller you know, we're not trying mm-hmm. to make somebody a graph pinker. We're not trying to, uh, necess- you know, we could give input, but I mean, we're not even, you know, we're, we've never run a machining company. Who, who are we to, that's, even, you know, like we, that's yeah, our we operational. Have, we have a common, we have common sense. I mean, yeah, we yeah. might know what the equipment's yeah. worth, but I feel like, you know, we, I'm sure you encounter people all the time that are just like, you know, I've got something nice here and I'm just tired. Yeah. Help me sell my business. I, I don't feel like improving. Do you sometimes take those clients on if the business is a nice, solid business? If it's a solid business, yes. But, you know, when you look at them overall, there's probably one out of 10 that is. Yeah. When And, and you have to, and, and that, and, and, and in that situation again, I only get paid if I sell that business. Sure. So I have to be really picky about whether or not we would even uh, entertain working with someone like that. And it's 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 a shame because that's how that 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 industry is built, and and it um, it puts a lot of people in at odds with each other when they do that. But it's, I mean, it works works. People still get things sold once in a while doing that. And, yeah. But yeah, we get people that come to us and uh, I mean, and it's the thing is funny. It's not profitability. It's not anything. It's how these businesses are. It's, it's, it's how a business is set up. If you really want sure. to, it, it's so much because we had a business last year that made a million dollars worth of profit, simple business. The owners were too involved in it and we couldn't get it sold. Couldn't get it sold. Yeah. They, people start looking at it and they go, Oh, too much, you know, million dollars profit. You'd think you'd be able to figure it out. You could hire some people that are really good. Nope, didn't want to do it. Is so is yeah. is is the problem often ego? Yes. That that plays a part in it definitely because people have worked really hard and they believe their business is worth something that it might not be. And the the second thing how that ego plays in is like, you're telling me that I've made a million dollars every year and I can't sell this thing. I made a million dollars every year. Are you, are you crazy? I mean, look at, I would say the same thing if I didn't know, if I didn't know what I knew about selling, you know, see the market buying, selling business. I totally understand what I think that's, are you a nutso? Well, I think they I, find out pretty quickly. They do. They do. They do. The yeah. buyer goes, they do. uh, I got nothing without you. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And it happens in big companies, man. It can, you can have 20, $30 million a year companies that are like that. Hmm. It, it's not just little ones. That's interesting. So, Is it easier to, to fix something large, medium, small? It, you know, the, our, our clients are typically going to be, you know, less right around 10 million, give or take a few million that we're working with because it's okay. a nice enough size that you can, can do it. You get up over 20, 30 million. And we've got clients who are in that range, that, but we've been with them when they were small. We've really grown them a long ways. Okay. And, and those are, but when you start with a $20 million company, trying to raise the value, double the value, how much, how much do I have to do when you look at a $4 million company and I want to double the value getting to 10 or 12 is not nearly as hard. Yeah. And, and the kind of structural changes and, and, you know, the, the baggage that's already there is a lot less too. So, okay. Uh, so what's the first thing you do? Obviously this is it's complicated, but the first no, thing you, it's not complicated. Yeah, that's true. I, yeah. I, I, I mean, it is a pretty simple concept. Uh, 
you know, replace yourself yeah. basically. Yeah. Um, you have to figure out how much is it, how much is it worth? First of all, it's just do a simple value market price. Right. That was another thing I was going to ask you about, you know, yeah. like people, people generally play around like three to five times EBITDA for a machining company. And, and generally mm-hmm. it, it seems to go down to three. Uh, I, okay. I, and, but maybe that's just because we're not adding any, uh, or we're not like building the company or anything. Um, well, it depends upon how it compares to others that they look at, right? Because buyers are going to have looked at other companies, most. And if you're better than them, I mean, if your gross margin is better than them, if your growth is better than the industry, I mean, you're going to get more money for it. If you And if it's set up right with a good team, you're going to get more for it than a, a company that's not doing that. But the value is important for, for the main reason is that if I, as, as the owner, am making a decision where I should stay in this business or I should sell this business, mm-hmm. I should know how much money I'm going to net out before I start the process or get pretty close, right? Because... You're going to spend six months to a year trying to sell a business. Mm -hmm. And if you don't get that value established and go, okay, it's worth a million bucks, but I can live with 750. I can live with 500. um, And I'm good with 500. So I got, got some room to play going into it. That's okay. But if I, if I get, and I say my, my business is worth about a million bucks and I need a million and a half or two million, so I'm going to try to sell it for two million. You're just wasting your time. Yeah. You I mean how many times have you seen somebody that's going to get double what what a piece of equipment's worth? It's got to be maybe a rare exception, but it's not usually uh, uh, in business. You just don't see stupid money running around. Yeah, I, I I know. It's just sometimes there's intangibles. There's sort of good fit. Um, well, yeah, and that, that'll flex the weight at some, but it, but it's not going to fluctuate it is, to double the value. Isn't it, more, isn't you know, it so. the right strategy to have the, the buyer make an offer for the business? Oh yes. Okay. Yes. So you, you said, well, the seller should come up with what he wants or she wants. Are you just saying they should come up with a number that they can go, this would make me happy when I leave, whether it's oh, yeah, the actual, should... whether that's the actual, they, cause often they don't know what it's worth. Yeah. I don't, it, that oh, the number you're talking about and the value of the business are two separate numbers. Yeah. And we say, no, you should go to your financial advisor and see what you really need. You may need zero because you've got great portfolio. Everything else is good. Or you should, they're going to tell you, you need this much from your business when you, when you get out of it, if you want to just continue the lifestyle you are and doing that. And and that's really what I'm talking about is that that you need to figure out, is that what I'm going to get from my business, likely get from my business, going to cover the gap? Uh, if there's no gap, then you're like, hey, cool, this is going to go to a charity or whatever the heck it's going to go to. Yeah. And and but it, but in most cases, this is a lot of the owner's uh personal assets. I mean, this is a lot of their portfolio. So yeah. we, we find a lot of times that, you know, they've got other investments, but this still is going to make up half or more of their portfolio for whatever they're going to do next, start a business, just retire, do whatever they're going to do. And that's why it's so important to get with your financial advisor and then, and then get with somebody that actually is going to give you a realistic value that you can go, okay, these things kind of match up. I'm going to be able to, if I can get it sold for this amount of money, I'm going to be pretty good yeah. and i think that's people the have first thing. some people have a lot of have pride though you know it's very obviously it's, it's you know yeah. this is my business is awesome so obviously it should be worth x you know whether it's whether they need that money or not you know yeah that's i mean it makes total sense um it's no different than buying a piece of property buying a car or whatever there's a value based on it based on that model that thing the return on the, the sentimentality location, return on a, yeah. yeah the mentality every and, and the ego is horrible and that and that's the number one reason why people don't get a business sold is because that ego gets in the way of what it what it's really worth what they think they should get and the industry people you know business brokers 
small to medium size handling small they're notorious for taking listings and telling somebody whatever the hell they want you know for the value just so they get a listing and i then hate go when on. people do that with machinery oh i'll get you oh, this yeah. i'll get you that right. and they're full of crap yeah and, yeah um, i can get it to you for this much and you know it's half of what they're going to have to pay and once they get people in they know that well maybe i'll get them to go in for twice as much you know if they have to it's how just, often do you have it where uh people undervalue their business almost never almost never I mean, we've, we've actually got one right now where somebody came in and we're like, holy heck, you're reasonable. Yeah. I mean, that's how often it happens. It's like, holy heck, you're reasonable. That's cool. Because usually it's usually it's it, it takes a long time for them really to understand the value. Uh, and and the cool part is, is if some of our clients, we've gone out and helped them buy businesses. Yeah. And they see the value and, and then they really understand their value and they go, oh, man, we're paying that for them. Look what I make. I don't make enough yet, do I? Nope. That's what we've been telling you. We got to keep going, <laughs> you know, and it's really fun once they understand it and and really do it. But no one undervalues their business. Well, unless they're just really naive and, you know, that's why you have to ask the 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 buyer. I mean, I'm sure the sometimes they get surprised by how much the buyer wants to to uh offer right i think you mean think that it's higher than what they they yeah. would expect mm, no no i mean it it's people there's enough information out there when people start to get ready to sell a business they're going to be reading they're going to look and you know do the google google search the biggest problem they have is is people will compare a privately held business with a with a public company because there's so much information on public company transactions uh -huh. even small public companies and a public company is valued at, at least double what a private company is and so it's you know they'll see something oh we got 10x of revenue for this machining company well is listed on the nasdaq or something you know or part of a public company i mean uh but i mean in our experience and again it's it's a you know small pinprick but we've seen clients and they just have no idea what their company is worth um mm -hmm. so i don't know maybe they just haven't done the research that they yeah um, well, easy way to easy way to figure out roughly what your company's worth is just go, okay, if I was taking a 10 year loan, how much cash is my business generating? And will it cover a loan for X amount of dollars? So if your business is generating $100,000 cash, uh, right now, that will get you about uh, $400,000 in business price. Huh? Based on the, the, because the SBA under 5 million, they, they fund a lot of loans and they require about, uh, $1.4, um, for every dollar that you have to pay back on a 10 year note. So you can, you can do these calculations pretty easy. The SBA now, I think they're uh, 10 and a half, 10 and three quarters, something like that. Their interest rate over 10 years. What's my payment, uh, for the year and. They call it the debt service coverage ratio. So you're going to see, set up your 10 year loan. It, it gets you really close because it's, it's you, at the end of the day, it's, it's either your business is making enough money to generate that or your equipment is worth more than your business is. All right. So yeah, rapid fire. What are a few killers, just huge mistakes that, that people make on either side? Well, in, in in machining, this is a little different, but usually if there's only one customer, and wow. that's not a really solid customer, that's a big deal. Um, I ran into a machining company that was doing aerospace work down in St. Louis a few years ago, and they had three owners, and one was a CEO, one was like had a PhD in something to do with machining, and then another person was their supply chain person. All three owners, all really good at what they did. Um, they were trying to sell it, this $20 million company, and they couldn't get offers that were even close to what it was worth because, you know, owners leaving, uh, when it's, when it's done, you know, if you're the, if you're the programmer, the setup person, and the, it doesn't matter if you've got a 24 seven lights out facility, you're probably going to have a hard time selling it. Unless they can train um, the person. 
Unless they can train them. There you go. Stay on a little bit. They could train. Yeah. They could train that person and keep them on. That'd be, that'd be good. You've limited your buying pool that, but you can, in those cases, I, I, I stand corrected there. That's a good point, but it's, it's, it's owner, owner involvement. Uh, it's customer concentration. And if you're in a market that has got a lot of risk, you know, like if you're all in an automotive and, Right. It or firearms or yeah 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 any of these that are that you know are volatile it's like i work with some oil field services people and that's that's a you know crazy up and down sometimes uh, you really got to understand where you're at in the cycles and things like that to to do it because if you're in a down cycle it's going to be hard there's bottom feeders yeah but i mean what is something that people do during the deal that can sabotage a deal. Oh, make a big change. Oh, we had one happen two years ago. Uh, totally normal. You got to use red zone thinking when you're in your when you're in your business sale. Don't make any changes. Just keep it running steady. Don't do anything. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh-huh. <laughs> Guy did this. It was a it was a, a, a company. He had an underperforming part of his company. It's like it's not making me enough money. He shut it down in between. Well, what it did is it took about. Uh, a third of the profitability out of the company by doing it and good long-term good long-term decision because it wasn't making a lot of money but it was contributing to the overall and increased the profitability well it dropped the value by a million dollars when he did it okay. and he got way outside of what he needed you know so in in a normal situation you just keep going like it is that it, hey it's not working that great but it's part of the overall yeah and that's what it does and and don't change too much. Just keep it running right. Do you see like lawyers and accountants sometimes messing things up? Yeah. yeah. Lawyers are, you, you've got to remember that lawyers are there to help you, not to protect you from everything. They can't protect you from everything. Yeah. We just finished the purchase of a small company and, and especially in small companies, right? Yeah, if we've seen it. Company, they get in and then they add some yeah. clause and the people are oh, like, yeah. what, what's that? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Because if you and I are doing a deal and we hand shook on what we wanted and they're trying to put something in that's, that doesn't make sense to your eye, we can tell lawyers it not, doesn't need to be in there. You have to, you have to control it because they will put, you'll, you'll get these purchases sale agreements that are 50 pages long for a $500,000 sale. And you're like, listen, I don't need a, first of all, I don't want to spend $10,000, $20,000 on this with, with a lawyer. But B, two thirds of it is not ever going to apply to me in the world. It's like, yes, if you know we got overrun by lava, yeah, we, we would want to be protected for that if we were right next to a volcano. But the nearest volcano is 4,000 miles away. We don't need to talk about that. You know, it's, that's the kind of stuff that comes into it. It's, you really got to be able to talk with them and say, okay, what is the real impact of this? Because we, we, as business owners, we deal with risk every day, but lawyers want to try to eliminate all the we, risk. We had we a can. deal where the lawyer, I mean, the deal had been done yeah. and, and it wasn't even a huge deal. Like, it, yeah. and the lawyer puts into his whole final statement, uh, X amount to be withheld until then. And of course the owner is like, what's this and i think yeah. this the 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 buyer didn't even know that the lawyer had put it in there yeah they're just yeah you know they're 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 trying to earn some money maybe trying to do what they are trying to make yeah. their thing um yeah but it's good you 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 need them to document the deal oh, absolutely. you want to do that's the thing. You got to stop them. You got and ask questions always. It's like, why would we do this? What is it going to protect me from? Okay, yes, no, because you, you as the person selling, I have to realize and put yourself in the other person's shoes and go. If they shove this across the table to me, what would I tell them? Okay, that's reasonable. Or no, and and in the last negotiations on the purchase and sale agreement, uh, buyers and sellers got to get comfortable with the fact that. The seller is, go- is trying to sell it for more money and the buyer is trying to buy it for less money. It's just the way it is, yeah. right? Don't get offended when they ask for this or ask for that. Just say, no, we really can't do that. 
give them a reason if you can, or if you just don't want to, just don't get offended. Cause yes. you talk about some of the things that people get offended and then it's just done. They walk away. Well, these guys are blah, blah, blah. Well, they're just asking. They were trying to do it. I think that's another, yeah, that's another thing. people. That's another to, one. I mean, I forgot need, to say that. Just get a, Yeah. Well now yeah. you, <laughs> um, just a couple of things, other, other things I, you know, for everybody's knowledge, Damon, after he interviewed me, you know, he was so gracious. He, he said, Hey, do you ever want to, if you ever want to just pick my brain, you can, you know, I'll set aside an hour and we can talk, you know, and, and, and we did, I mean, I just have to say, you mean, you're, you're very, um, giving of your knowledge of your time of, um, you know, to me, I, you know, we had one conversation, I filled out some form in your podcast, uh, you know, talk about that, about the point of, of giving and giving for free and, and your philosophy, because clearly that's something important to you. Well, it's, it's, it's for me, um, I didn't realize this until later in life is that you see people that are truly happy and successful. It's because they're giving it. And I, I believe anyway. Yeah. And, 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 and I think it's also when people find what they're really, what they believe that, that, you know, that their higher power has them here to do. And for me, it's to help, help, you know, be a good person with my family and friends and everything like that, of course. But, the, but it's really to help people figure this out. Business owners shouldn't be sitting there struggling. And I'll, I'll tell everybody a hundred percent of what I do. I don't care. Tell you a hundred percent, go do it yourself. If, if that's going to make the difference, because I know if I do that, there's enough people that will need my help. They will need my help. And it's proves it proves itself every day. And the more I help, the more I help people and just give away stuff and show them how to do things, the more I have people coming to me that want help and will pay me for it. And it's, it's, it's reciprocity it and karma yeah. and creating dots. And well, you talk about serendipity, right? That's what comes out of it. It comes out of it. Just out of the goodness of your heart, help them share and giving people and, and, and just not expecting. So is this something that, and it's probably a combination, uh, is this something that you just kind of naturally do? It's just instinctual or is it something that you, you kind of remind yourself sometimes like I ought to be giving, I ought to be, um, you know, it would be a good thing if I offered my help to somebody, to this person, or is it just, it just comes right out of you? Um, it comes out of you after a while. Okay. Yeah. It comes out of you after a while, but it doesn't, it's not in the beginning. It takes a while and it, and it's still, you fall back. I mean, it's like, we're human, right? We forget. We forget. Okay. And, so you but, do, you remind yourself sometimes. Oh yeah. Yeah. You have to remind yourself. It's like anything. It's like, you know, you, you're trying to change habits in your life. It, you know, you want to quit smoking. You're still probably 20 years later going to think about it. You know, so it's, it's, it gets easier though. And it gets better and better as you, as you go and it, and you keep going and it's really, really fun. It's really fun. So much fun. Especially, I mean, when you got to find your passion, you get to do it, you get to help people. It's just so much fun. Even when it sucks, it's fun. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, do you have anything else to say to the people of the world before we? Uh, you know, if you're out there and you're, I mean, I meet people every day that would be in seemingly pretty icky conditions that are happy. Yeah. And, and I never realized that happiness doesn't mean that I'm, I, for a long time, it took me a long time to realize that you can be happy wherever you're at. If you can work at that, you're going to be a lot better things are going to be a lot better. That is really good wisdom. Uh, Damon, um, I really appreciate this. This is so much fun. Uh, if, if anybody wants to check out your stuff, tell, give, give a shout out to, to yourself. Um, exit your way.us.com.ca. 
And yeah, the Faces of there. Business podcast. The how many, Faces of Business podcast. How many of link, those do you broadcast? In, Damon how, how many of those do you broadcast a week? I do two a week pretty regular. So, I mean, I, th- I think I'm up to like 300 and some episodes of that. And then the other shows I do, I do two more of those a week. So we're What are the other shows you do? Uh, manufacturing e-commerce success. I do that Mondays and Fridays and uh, with Kurt Anderson. And then I um, do Tuesdays and Thursdays on the face of the business. Man. Yep. I, 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 well, we've talked about it. I don't, you, you clearly are much better at delegating <laughs> and automating than I. Yeah, a pro- process, process, build the process, and have have people figure out how to help you. Have that teach them how to help you. That's what I've done. Thank you.